Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. I'm your spicy host, Tara Rose, and I'm here every episode to expose, uncover, and share what I know about SEX. This isn't what you find in your typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under discussed, and I'm doing what I can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, I invite you to get social with me. My Instagram is the.sexed.show, and I'd love for you to give me a follow. So as we dive into today's episode, it's crucial to acknowledge and honor the land in which I live, work, and play. I stand on the traditional territories of Treaty 7. This expansive landscape carries the stories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina Nation, and the Stony Nakoda Nations. The Métis Nation of Alberta further enriches the cultures and experiences within this territory. May this acknowledgement deepen my connection to the earth beneath me and cultivate a spirit of reverence for the life woven into the soil of Treaty 7. So today, we are exploring the realms of somatic exploration, sexual wellness, and personal transformation. Joining me is Rahi Chun, a specialist in somatic sexual wholeness with a focus on pelvic and genital dearmoring. Rahi's work centers around the profound connection between the body, mind, and spirit, and his insights into unlocking pleasure and releasing energetic blocks are nothing short of transformative. In this episode, we'll be exploring the fascinating world of pelvic and genital dearmoring, diving deep into the physical, emotional, and energetic dimensions of this practice. Get ready to open the doors to pleasure, embrace embodiment, and embark on a journey of self-discovery as we start in on this insightful conversation. Welcome, Rahi. Thank you so much, Tara. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Oh, it's such a pleasure to have you on here. I've had a lot of people asking me about what this is since mm -hmm. I attended the training. So I was like, this this is great. I'm so excited to be sharing this with everybody. Awesome. So usually the beginning of my show, I like to offer a somatic inquiry. And you said you would love to do it. Sure. Sure. Yay. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that invitation. I love facilitating somatic contemplation. So I would invite your audience members and you to settle in and notice how your body is being supported right now. So there may be support if you're leaning against a chair, the backside, you know, may be supported by, you know, the, the back of a couch or a, or a bedpost. Your weight may be supported by whatever you're sitting on, maybe the ground or the bed or a, or a couch. Just notice where the areas of support are in your body. And notice if you can give your body the permission to really be supported even more, receive that support, whatever that means to your body. We're always being supported by the gravitational pull of the earth, which supports our balance, which is further supported by the balancing of our weight on our sit bones if we're sitting. And once you identify how and where your body's being supported, I'm gonna invite you to bring your awareness to whatever sensations are present in your body right now. There might be sensations of temperature, texture, if you're feeling something, maybe your clothes or the fabric on the couch or bed. There might be sensations of energy movement, whatever it is for you. And notice as your awareness lands on whatever sensations are present, there may be new sensations that rise in to take the place of what the awareness was on. So it's like an evolution of your awareness landing on different sensations in the body. Now 
Now I'm going to ask you to bring your awareness to what feels particularly good in your body right now, whatever good means to you. Good might mean pleasure, it might mean support, it might mean groundedness, or it might mean a lack of tension. So what feels good in your body right now? Notice the sensations that are indicating there's goodness here for you. And now I'm gonna bring your awareness to your pelvis and your genitalia. And just notice what sensations or emotions arise as you're being directed to be present with your pelvis and genitalia. And I'm gonna invite you to pose a question to your pelvis and genitalia. It's a very simple question of asking your genitalia, what do you want me to know about you? And stay open for whatever response arises. What do you want me to know about you? Or what is it that you want to share with me about you? And really staying open to whatever your genitalia has to share with you about itself. And notice if there's any feelings that come up, emotions, and welcome them, or sensations. Maybe there are images or memories that arise. Just really stay open to all of the communication. And now I'm going to ask you to feel into where you're feeling the most love in your body. It might be your genitalia, or it might be your heart center, or somewhere else. And on the next inhale, I'm going to ask you to inhale into that source of love. And on the exhale, send it to your genitalia. So we'll just inhale into whatever that source of love is, gently. And on the exhale, gently send those loving vibes and blessings and sentiments to your pelvis and your genital region. Let's do that one more time, breathing into the source of love in your body. And then exhaling, directing that energy to your genitalia and pelvis. And notice if there's a response from your genitalia and pelvis of receiving that. Letting that energy settle, I'm going to invite you to share whatever acknowledgement or blessing or appreciation you have towards your genitalia for engaging in this little somatic contemplation before we come back to the interview. When you're ready, you can open your eyelids. Hopefully you weren't doing this while you were driving on the road. <laughs> or jogging or taking a walk somewhere. Hopefully you're safe and sound. Ah, Amazing. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. I uh I notice when I hear your voice because I watched so many videos that mm -hmm. I immediately my body just starts like down regulating. Like I was oh. yawning and <laughs> lovely, lovely. Yeah, I feel like there's so many opportunities we have during the day to really connect with our genitals and our pelvis. It doesn't have to be touch. It can be touch. We go to the bathroom to empty our bladder so often during the day, you know, just to give a warm hug or an acknowledgement 
or like in a meeting when you're in line somewhere at the restaurant. I mean, there's just so many opportunities to really deepen this intimate connection. And I find that the more we do this, the more responsive the genitalia usually becomes. Yeah, that's actually a really good point to make. I don't think I acknowledged my genitals all day today because I've been mm -hmm. so busy in meetings and in yeah. doing mode that yeah. I, until we like just did this somatic inquiry, was like, oh, I need to do this more. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I you know, I find it helpful to have some sort of like regular ritualistic time in the day. It could be before a meal because, you know, some people pray before a meal. It just takes a few seconds to kind of cup your vulva or cup your balls, whatever your genitals are, and just thank your genitals along with your meal. You know, I like to do it when I empty my bladder because I'm making, you know, I'm, I'm touching my genitals anyway. Mm -hmm. So just to give a, a loving acknowledgement, it, it kind of, I don't, it does something to my awareness of that genital heart connection throughout the day when I do it intermittently throughout the day. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. It's like, a some people have those chimes, Yeah, you know, it goes off every two hours or something and it's like, Oh, yeah. take a few breaths. What do you notice in your body? It's basically the same, but including mm. the genitals, which so often are neglected and like, right. <laughs> there's so much stigma and shame. Oh, yeah. I, I always find it interesting how, like in America, when I go for a, for a massage, they just avoid these really, you know, these uh, central core areas that are so core to my identity and it's like they're just and I think that sends a message you know and uh depending on whether we were shamed about our genitalia when we were children or you know uh, judged for it it, it it can almost affirm that message by ignoring it altogether and of course I understand why you know they are what they are you know the rules because it is very vulnerable and private but you know we shouldn't do that with our own genitalia, you know, like this is our genitalia, you know, mm -hmm. we shouldn't take that on just because society's like, you know, tripping out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The donut massage. Yes. Yeah. Like avoid exactly. the breasts on women or right. people who have breasts and yeah, the genitals, even, even your glutes, you know, yes. like, yeah, we're pretty careful about where they go and how close they totally. get to your butt crack. Totally, totally. And it can be a little like when I'm in Thailand or in other countries, like when they include the glutes, because, you know, if the glute muscles are tight, that'll pull on your lower back muscles, which will pull on your shoulder muscle. It's all interconnected. Sometimes I can, it takes a little bit of an adjustment, but it's like, yes, of course, all the muscles are interconnected. If you really want to relieve the tension, you have to release the glute muscles as well, you know? And that's why when I give sessions and, you know, every part of the body, we want to increase blood flow. We want healthy tissue response. We want, you know, greater sensitivity. It's like, oh my God, I feel whole. I feel whole now because mm -hmm. my whole body is being acknowledged. Yeah. And I mean, this is a great segue into everything that we're going to touch on with dearmoring mm -hmm. because that's part sometimes what leads to armor being built in the body is having that disconnection or thinking that it's bad or taboo, or the stigma attached to your own genitals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And we all have a very, very unique set of influences from our upbringing, you know, and that's something I really encourage, you know, clients and students to look into because so much of genital armor starts to form, you know, when we're infants, how are we diaper changed? How are we potty trained? You know, were our parents disgusted by our, our pooping or changing our diaper? What message does that give us when we're not seeing enough of our parents as it is and they're expressing disgust about, you know, simple bodily functions? Does that create armor around my anal sphincter or my, you know, urethra? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are, this is, this is where it starts mm -hmm. is, you know, and then of course there are layers of like religious conditioning, societal shaming, you know, personal, like transgenerational trauma. Like if my parents were, you know, if they had unresolved sexual trauma, just as an example, 
and they were very if they did avoided their own genital you know contact at all costs then children are very very sensitive they're going to pick up on this and you know it becomes like a learned behavior Mm -hmm. yeah you're so right with that seen it in my own nuclear family (laughs) sure would you be willing to share a little bit about what genital dearmoring is for people who Mm -hmm. are like okay what is this word dearmoring Sure, sure. That's a great starting off point. So the simple way of, of of describing it is, for me, genital armor is the unconscious and wise guarding response, unconscious guarding response by the tissues and fascia of the genitalia to protect itself from either the threat of harm or the perceived threat of harm. So I mean, we shared some instances, like if there is a sense of judging by our parents of our genitalia, if there's a shaming by, you know, like I have clients who were believed that sexual pleasure is sinful. So here there are, here they are as children, you know, wiping their vulva or wiping, you know, like after, after urinating and they feel some pleasure. Like, what does that do to the psyche of a young child who wants to be good and doesn't want to go to hell? So these are all influences that causes the the unconscious guarding patterns of the musculature, the tissue and fascia of the body, but we're talking about the genitalia here, to start armoring. And this armoring will start to result in either a numbing, a desensitization, or on the flip side of that, it can cause pain or discomfort. Mm-hmm. I just got off the phone this morning with a, a woman who you know, had a, believes her pelvic bowl was tense as far back as she can remember. And, you know, her home circumstances were such that explains, I mean, here's the other thing is the pelvic bowl is the home to our root chakra, which is related to all issues of security and safety. So if there is any kind of threat or danger to our safety or security, and as an infant, we're, you know, like if, if mom, is late, you know, doesn't, is late for, you know, doesn't come home from work on time, like for to an infant who is, is hungry for the mother's milk, that's going to cause some sort of alarm. And so, you know, one of my mentors in Europe, Suzanne Rusgaard, she shares that 80% of all of the pelvic armoring, the unconscious guarding patterns in the pelvis that she recognizes comes from non-sexuality related issues from childhood. Wow. Yeah. That's so high. It's profound. It's profound. But, you know, when you understand that the body is designed to protect itself from harm or a perceived threat, and so much of our security and safety issues, you know, are held in the pelvic bowl, like it's understandable, you know, why, why that happens. But, you know, as adults, we don't understand, oh, you know, you know, we don't understand the effects of armor of why our pleasure isn't as, you know, colorful as it once was, you know, why we're feeling less responsiveness. We chalk it up to, oh, you know, I've given birth or, you know, I'm just at that age or, you know, whatever the excuses are and not realizing, no, this is actually genital armor. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that if somebody experienced that lack that caused the armor, they also get put into like situations or find themselves in situations where there's more armor that's being built on. So for example, if somebody had a parent who was very like tedious about potty training and stuff down the road, would they maybe experience a higher chance of like sexual assault or something like that? Um, because of their inability to notice that area of their body and what they want. It's yeah, kind of where I'm trying to go with it. I'm sorry. I know that's no, like my no, thought no. is like, yeah, no, I think I, I understand what you're saying. So there's a number of things here, and they're really important threads to tease out. Like one, I do believe we internalize like the parental care that we receive. And specifically here, the parental neglect of our genitalia, of our sexuality, we definitely internalize that in how we treat ourselves. 
So that's like one big piece. Like if I grew up in a home and there was a discounting or dismissal of the important energy, spiritual potential, intimate connection of sexual life force, then, you know, then it's often that we're socialized in that soup. So we take on those belief systems. Right. It's also common for people to internalize how our genitalia were treated by our parents. Like if they were judged, if they were shamed, then we often take on that behavior as well and do that to ourselves. Right. The other thing that you're, I think you're alluding to is, you know, oftentimes when there is a mistreatment of our sexuality when we're young, especially by someone we love, like a caretaker, a lot of times we will wire or associate the love we wanted from a caretaker with that, you know, oftentimes abusive behavior. Yes, that's kind of where and, I was going with that. And be drawn to that. So, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. an easy example is like I have a client or I had a client who's a, a, you know, professional psychiatrist. Professional life is very successful. He can only have sex with complete strangers that involve humiliation and leather. Yeah. So, you know, when we did the intake, it was revealed that he grew up as a gay boy in the Midwest. His father would kick the shit out of him, you know, surprise, surprise, with leather boots. So there's this pairing of humiliation, leather, because he's wanting the love that every child wants from a parent, but he's wired this with the treatment that he received. You know, I have another client who, I mean, when before she came to me, she could only have orgasms by having her hair pulled, you know, because that's that's the treatment she received from her mother growing up. Mm -hmm. So this happens often as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this I consider, I mean, in the realm of armor, it's more of a unhealthy wired association, but it can certainly create armor in the body. Yeah. Yeah. And to add on an example, like I was sexually molested when I was a child mm -hmm. and I know in one of the trainings I watched, you talked about how that causes like a hyper arousal. And so you're always like wanting to be up here and slowing mm -hmm. down and you're always looking for that risk. Yes. Because it was big feelings in a little body. Yes. And so you seek that out in yeah. other intimate or sexual exchanges with other yes. people. And man, did I do that? And then it got to a point where the anxiety around sex mm -hmm. and intimacy was just so much that I I had to take that step back and I'm like, what's going on in my body? Wow. Yeah. That's so great that you got to the point that you had the, you know, the wisdom to step back and examine, like, what is really going on here? Why am I being drawn to dangerous, risky, high voltage, you know, and, you know, sexual energy situations? But if you think back, you know, I don't know how young you were, but in most situations, especially if you know the, the the young body before puberty, the sexual voltage in that in a, a seven year old or even a twelve year old before the full maturation of of puberty is of a much smaller voltage than an adult who's gone through puberty. You know, especially if it's a much older adult, and so. If there is a molestation, incest, you know, boundary violation the pleasure and a lot of times it's not even physiological pleasure but the attention that the young child is receiving that has always cr been craving from an older authority figure gets wired with this incredibly high voltage of energy yeah. and so that pairing is what they start seeking out and can only kind of feel satisfied by that overwhelming voltage explains the praise kink <laughs> the praise kid. yeah 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 exactly exactly but oh. you know i think the danger you know i mean there are there are many like i i don't have any judgments around you know sexual kinks or preferences unless it is it, it goes counter to what the person really wants right mm -hmm. and most people want a capacity to feel good and pleasure and the danger of being drawn to those high voltage situations is that one, you dissociate, you're not present in your body. And 
And the high voltage ends up being so overwhelming. Like if I'm wanting it harder, faster, more than I'm, it's starting to numb the tissues of sensitivity, you know, around the vulva, around the anal sphincter, around, you know, whatever, you know, orifice, you know, that, that you're engaging in. And mm -hmm. that's where arm can form and eventually start to numb and desensitize. And then you just need, you know, higher and higher stimuli and voltage to get yeah. the same effect. And then you're like, you're putting yourself in really dangerous situations often. Yeah. And also like, sexual assault isn't the only way that the body armors too. Yes. I I have a lot of clients who have what I call religious trauma, even emotional trauma. If they, like you said, upbringing parents didn't really explain their genitals to them and that they were available as a source of pleasure. I've had birth trauma. That's a pretty common one that I've seen too. Yeah. Lots of birth trauma uh, coming mm -hmm. through my door, but it, it's, there's so many different ways that our pelvis, our genitals just holds and stores trauma and our society and how our culture is set up is not conducive to yeah. de-armoring it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the way, you know, like sexuality is portrayed in the media is, you know, there's no foreplay. I mean, right. if, if there was an accurate kind of movie about for the whole movie would just be about foreplay right and so they just go for the result you know it's like i don't know i feel like in in media in storytelling in movies or tv the couple gets together there's kind of like primal thrusting that somehow leads to an orgasm <laughs> and then and then you know they go on with the plot they grab their guns and run out the door or whatever whatever yeah. it is you know and yeah. so, yeah, there, there's, um, you know, and then porn, is, you know, we can go on and on about porn, which is 10 times worse. But, you know, to your point, it's not just in like high voltage situations. I have a lot, a lot of clients who have been married to someone they love for decades, but they do not, they still don't, haven't engaged in ample foreplay. So, you know, the vulva, the erogenous, right? The, the, yes. the, <laughs> you know, the, the erogenous capacity has not come into full bloom because the engorgeable tissues are, are hardly engorged, you know, and then they're being penetrated like before their body's really ready, but because of past patterns or fawn response or people pleasing or whatever it is, you know, and this is how armor can form within perfectly loving couples. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. Wow. Like you yeah. hit the nail on the head with that. And I mean, you, you listened to some of the Pamela Madsen one where we talked about more than penetration because I, we're just so obsessed with penis and vagina. Like that yes. is our culture is so obsessed with it and really having nights of intimacy and where you're cultivating intimacy, where that is off the table, off the table. And also get a massage table. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One way touch is like, it's such an education and, you know, couples learn so much and, you know, it's probably the same with you. I have couples who've never really explored one way touch with their partner and they've been mm -hmm. together for a decade. And so they're assuming so many things. They're really kind of assuming that what they're doing to their partner is what their partner wants. And maybe it is, but there are so many treasures to discover with one-way touch on a massage table when one person has no responsibility, but simply being present to their sensations in receiving touch. The couples learn so much about their partner's body, about their own body. And then, you know, and then it doesn't become routine. It doesn't become predictable. And it's a whole new landscape of exploration with pleasure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even when I offer the three minute game in sessions with, even if it's just one-on-one -on -one with somebody and I'm like, you can bring this home to your partner. They're just mind blowing. Yes. And it's such a simple exercise, but it really like sets the tone and a foundation of how you can enhance that into yeah. you know exploring the whole body and then i'm like when you feel ready like do it with your genitals like yeah 
play that game with your genitals and people are just like, wow, I never knew it this way. Isn't it fascinating? Because it is such a simple, it's such a simple concept, such a simple game. But I think that speaks to how, you know, how elementary, I mean, it's almost like we're in kindergarten when it comes to like understanding what our body likes and certainly giving voice and consent to what our body wants and how to tell our partner, this is, doesn't feel, this isn't it. This doesn't feel good. You know, most people just go along with it, waiting for something to shift. Mm -hmm. And we have not been taught as a society how to give voice to our body's choices. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of our job as practitioners yes. to set that with our clients yes. too. That's, pr that's basically step one, I'd say one A and then one B is somatic awareness, like really ensuring that they're aware of what's going on in their body and what their body is telling them. Yeah. Because again, like that's another thing that's not supported in our culture. Yes. Yeah. And that's why I really love like in sex, you know, somatic sex educators, like the mapping process is such a cornerstone and it's so important. And once again, it's a very simple concept, but you know, so many people, and I have Tantra teachers come in as clients, like even they don't know their full erogenous anatomy, genital anatomy. And so if you don't know it, you can't really give voice to it. You can just say, you know, yes, you know, my, you know, my vagina wants your penis inside, but maybe it's your interior area or your case spot, or maybe it's your cervix. You can, you know, unless you really understand the map of what pleasure your body likes, you you can't give voice to it. Mm -hmm. And I find that all of these erogenous zones, the more attention they're given and the more they're explored, the more sensations of pleasure they elicit. You know, so dearmoring the cervix, for example, is is really mind blowing for clients because they had no concept that these sensations of pleasure even exist. Yeah. And and the more the more the cervix is given the kind and quality of touch and attention it wants, the more receptive and open and responsive it becomes. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people who have cervixes associate it with pain. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and then, you know, certainly for penis owners, you know, so many are not even aware of the pleasure potential of their prostate or even their anal sphincters. Right. And, it's like, you know, vulva owners have at least have a, a like their genital anatomy is structured in a way where you can explore and wake up the intrapelvic nerves. Penis owners don't have that other than the anal sphincter because you can't go into the penis. You know, you can't access those nerves, you know, intrapelvically through the genitalia. And so it is such a gold mine of sensation to explore for health reasons as well as pleasure and, and, and sensation reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, a huge taboo thing in our culture. Yeah. Right. If you like it in your butt, then we're going to associate that with being gay. And right. it's, right. yeah, yeah. And I'm so lucky to have a partner who is super open to that and really has a, a great grasp on his prostate and his anus and awesome. it's like yeah i would love like anytime you want to go there <laughs> yeah 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 well he's very wise and you know he's going to be you know he's going to be much he's much more healthier as a result mm -hmm. you know it's like we're you know people who are shutting off from from you know it's like you're you're really shutting off from prostate health from pelvic health like a simple anal vibrator will is a great way to relax the um, the rings of muscle around the anal sphincter. It can increase blood flow for your erections. I mean, there's so many benefits to it. And, you know, to discount it just because of a, you know, outdated taboo is a real shame. Yeah, yeah, it is. What What other like stigmas or misconceptions do people have when you say, hey, I do genital de-armoring or sure you know <laughs> i think one of the big misconceptions is that i think because of the the word armor or de-armoring sounds like you're 
you know, you've got a hammer and chisel and you're like, you know, hacking Ooh, away yeah. this like metal, you know, like armor. And people don't realize that, you know, the 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 best and most effective way to de-armor the genitalia is to have very safe, consensual, heart-centered lovemaking because pleasure is like the most effective way to de-armor. I mean, there are specific techniques to de-armor the G-spot, the cervix, you know, the, the, the veins within the testicles, the, the, the penile shaft, but to kind of say, say this broadly, I think one of the misconceptions is that genital de-armoring means like it's gonna be painful or it's like going into the dentist. No, it could be incredibly spiritual. It could be incredibly like erotically expansive. And so, you know, genital de-armoring, I'm thinking about like, do I wanna rebrand it as genital awakening? Cause that's really what it is. It's awakening the sensations and energy within the genitalia. Mm -hmm. And in that is releasing any armor that's outdated. But that would be one misconception is people are afraid that genital de-armoring means it's going to be somehow an arduous experience and it can be a wonderfully expansive, pleasurable, empowering and educational experience. I mean, it mostly is. And I think a lot of people too associate it to like pelvic floor therapy, which from my experience wasn't you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it probably caused more armor. Like <laughs> that's that's how it's been for most of my clients who come to me after pelvic uh, PT. Yeah, because you know, I I think there's a place for it, but yes. my understanding is that pelvic physical therapists do not understand or respect the ways in which our unintegrated emotions are held in the tissue and fascia. So they're just manipulating it without any kind of sensitivity to what past memories or un unresolved traumas it may bring up in the client's body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I work pretty closely with a vaginal health clinic here called Maud Medical, and they have a lot of pelvic floor therapists. And I went in and did a, a demo for them. And sometimes I get referrals from them because, you know, they'll be in session with a client and a lot of emotion comes up yeah. and they're like, Oh, this is more of like Tara's. Oh, so right. They'll refer the client to me, which I'm grateful for. Yeah. It's nice that they see that as a valuable addition to, to healing. Yeah. 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 I mean, I feel like that's just like the golden opportunity for healing is when the emotions can actually finally come forward mm -hmm. to release and integrate, you know, whatever event that the emotions are related to. And I feel like pelvic PTs are kind of like pushing the emotions out of the way, even though it's like this golden opportunity, like who knows how many years this emotion was buried and touching into it physiologically is, is providing the opportunity for that to discharge. And they're not really trained in knowing how to discharge it. Right. There's no trauma informed right. <laughs> aspect. Right. 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 Yeah. And for us, it's like, it's gold. It's like a golden opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I welcome all of the emotions all the time. I'm always telling my clients, all of you is welcome here. However, so, that shows up. So good. So good. You know, I would say the other misconception about genital de-armoring is that it, it's about sexuality. You know, it's only about sexuality. You know, and I consider genital de-armoring, you know, as as we were discussing earlier, like, you know, if 80 percent of this armor is a result of, you know, events that happen in childhood regarding safety and security issues, then we're going around in life not realizing how this pelvic armor stored in our pelvises are interrupting opportunities that may be perfectly safe and secure, but something in our pelvis is holding us back. Mm -hmm. So it may have to do with sexuality. You know, it could be a business opportunity. It could be a personal trip somewhere, you know, but the armor in our pelvis is saying, whoa, 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 that doesn't feel safe. Right. And that, wow. that armor could be very outdated. It might be something from childhood or something that happened when we were very young and not relevant to like what's happening now as an adult. So what I'm hearing is it could come up as like 
a worthiness thing or imposter syndrome sort of deal. Yeah. Yeah. Like anything that speaks to an insecurity or feeling a lack of safety, right? That could have to do with your identity, you know, and imposter syndrome or any kind of, you know, it's like, I think in our minds, we all want to be adventurous, but, you know, sometimes there could be armor in the pelvis that are holding us back from really jumping, jumping in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense to me. Even, (laughs) even when I'm in situations where I'm like really nervous or like pushing on my edge of resilience, you know, a public speaking event, for example, I notice like my butt and all of the muscles in my butt and my anus, like really are tight. Yeah. And like it even yeah. comes through as that. And I'm like, oh, I know I've got to relax, breathe into it, breathe into yeah. my butt. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, that's a great example. Like if they're like, depending on what the default state of, of tension is in the, in the butt, you know, in those, in those security safety arenas, like de-armoring that area, you know, before a public speaking event or whatever the situation is, there'll probably still be a reflexive uh, tension, but not as, you know, not as much as after you've released some armor, Right. you know, it could be that, you know, like I spoke to someone this morning whose father kind of just left when they were two years old. So they have this abandonment wound, you know, and I'm very curious, like, where in or in and around the heart center and or the pelvis is that two-year-old traumatic event stored Mm. and just just releasing that allow her the freedom to engage in adult intimacy relationships in a way without that fear of abandonment right yeah oh yeah so going back to the misconception it's like genital de-armoring is not just about sexuality it's really you know a lot of our bigger life issues can mm-hmm. be stored in genital armor. I think too, people don't really, un- unless it starts to impact their sexuality, they mm. don't really notice it. And so that's usually the the moment where they're like, okay, I need to like Google a sex coach or something. And yeah. that's usually how they find me is they're looking for that, but they don't even notice how, this is impacting other areas of their life, whether it be their career, relationship to family or friends, those, those types of things. They just, that's just how it is. They're running on autopilot with it. Yeah. And they think, oh, my risk tolerance is this, you know, when in fact it doesn't have to be, Yeah. you know? And I mean, what I notice within my clients is the greater their capacity to feel safe with pleasure expands because pleasure is just good energy. It's more life force. They start to, I mean, I just noticed they start to get uh, promotions at their work. They start getting healthier relationships because their sense of safety in receiving good things start to expand. That's so beautiful. It is. It's really, it's powerful because it really speaks to, you know, what an incredible gateway our sexual health and our sexual life force is to really all areas of life yeah i'm curious rahi how did you find this work how did you get into this profession sure sure well i would say there are a couple of touchstones it's like i didn't grow up thinking oh my dream is to be a sex life <laughs> body worker right. um uh you know, I was engaged with other professions, but I would say the kind of the most significant experiences were that I came out of my mom's womb with very crooked legs. It, the way I was positioned in her womb kind of made them crooked when I came out and the doctors wanted to do surgery on my knees, but my mom was a nurse and she said, no, I'll, I'll massage, I'll lotion and massage his legs, which she did every night for three years. And eventually they grew out straight. Wow. So yeah, it was pretty amazing. So like my my body was healed by touch. That's kind of the first cornerstone. And then when I was in college, I lived in Japan and was just really fascinated with different forms of meditation. And uh, I found a monastery in the north of Thailand that took in foreigners. And I I was just really, it's almost like this infinite vortex of presence that I, that I, 
was I was just fascinated by. And somehow this combination of intentional touch with unconditional presence seemed to have an unraveling effect in my in my lover at the time. So if there's tension in the body, I found that this combination of having intentional touch, loving touch with presence was it, it was able to meet whatever was binding tension in the body. And, and then I'd say the other kind of big, you know, turning point was when I went to my first Tantra retreat, it had to do with releasing trauma from the pelvis. And I was paired with a woman who was about 20 years older than me, a survivor of incest. And she had like patches of numbness and pain all around her vulva and intravaginally. And by the end of the week, simple exercises using breath, sound, presence, movement. I mean, there was so much sensation that was restored. Wow. My mind was kind of blown. Yeah, I was like, God, I, I want to learn everything I can about this. And so that took me on a path down, you know, tantric practices and then Taoist practices. And I spent time in Thailand studying with Montauk Chia. And then I got a master's in psychology and then got really fascinated with like initial touch imprints, initial relational imprints and how that affects our adult sexuality. And so, you know, I would say like, I mean, it's none of it was planned. I just kind of followed my curiosity. Mm -hmm. That makes and sense then, to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as we all know, like our clients are really our teachers yeah. and, you know, so many miraculous things I've seen within bodies, you know, heal themselves once there's safety and a container created, you know, cause I've had clients who were, you know, circumcised when they were, you know, clitoral circumcision at a young age, or, you know, I've had clients who were prostituted as children, you know, but had those memories blocked out until they were like 40. And, you know, this, you know, she was at a Tony Robbins seminar and Tony Robbins said, what does money mean to you? And her hand just kind of went into the air and her, this, these words came out of her mouth, selling my body. And she didn't know where it came from. And then all of these memories like came flooding back to her of wow. being prosecuted as a child. And of course she was like shaking for days but like, you know, having had clients like that go from having all this genital armor to just these simple practices of releasing it by integrating these past traumatic experiences and then being able to have, you know, healthy orgasmic responses is always mind blowing. I'm always like, I just feel so privileged, privileged to get to witness these things that that is just kind of inspired me to learn more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's been an organic unfolding. Yeah. Following the breadcrumbs. Following, <laughs> just following the bliss <laughs> and how I'm guided. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Exactly. Interesting. I didn't know everything. I think I knew a few bits, bits and pieces, but I'm always curious how people find themselves in this type of work because. Me too. Me it, too. Yeah, yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. And it really requires like kind of a, I don't know, almost like a bit of rebelliousness and a bit of a, <laughs> you know, like a bit yes. of a odd bird yeah. to like follow the crumbs enough to make it a profession. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, that was always me. I was always curious in Tantra and I'm like, how do I get into this? And I never really found the thing that stuck for me. And then when I found the Institute, that I, I got my certification through. I was like, yeah. this, this is it. This is what I yeah. was looking for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so cool that you followed the breadcrumbs and you followed your curiosity, you know, and I feel like, you know, in sexuality, that's really what's required is, is a curious mind and following where the energy, where your desire, where your interest takes you, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, we we will be confronted, each of us, with our past conditioning as we follow those breadcrumbs. But the life force is what created us. And it's so, I don't know, it's it's aliveness. It's really following our aliveness. Mm -hmm. It really is. So we're kind of nearing the end. And I had three yep. audience questions that came in on Instagram around right. this. I'm just going to pull them up. And if it's not one you want to answer, just let me know too. 
Okay. Your no is always welcome. All right. First question is how long does it take before a client starts to notice results? Sure. That's a great question. And as you can imagine, the answer is really varied, right? Right. Based on the history of their armor. Right. Right. It also, it also, I should say this, it also depends on how much like emotional work they've done before they come to a de-armoring session. Like it's different if someone's been in therapy for years and they feel like they've really addressed the emotional consequences of the trauma as opposed to someone who's just coming in, not having dealt with that. Yeah. Now, having said all that, I've seen, you know, like in our training, the the demo of internal work, like her cervix de-armored pretty much within that one session, you know, to the point of having an orgasm. So like it can happen within one session. And then I've also had clients where like it is something very complex that requires many stages of resolving trauma, coming to terms with it, and then kind of updating their physiology. So it, it, you know, there's no kind of cookie cutter. And this is what I find fascinating about our work is every client's body is so unique, you know, with its very unique history Mm -hmm. and it's kind of unique soul's evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, that's what I say. I'm like, every body is different. Every nervous system is different. Yes. I'm usually by like, so for me, when I do sessions, they're an hour and a half and it's really just building foundation. Then there's, there's not any de-armoring in that, Mm -hmm. in that portion. But after about two or three of those, I have a better sense of like where the energy might go and what the, like what an actual de-armoring session might look like and how many of those we might need, but it's always changing. I mean, we're humans, we're going through shit all the time. Like (laughs) that impacts us. Yeah. 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 I usually share with clients that the average client receives anywhere from three to eight sessions, you know, just to give them some sort of expectation, but that really, you know, we really have to surrender to the wisdom of your body and the pace that feels safe for your body to move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Moving at the speed of trust. Yes, absolutely. Second question is, do I have to be nude? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question as well. I guess it depends on what it is that you're wanting to resolve. You know, if it's, if it's issues around boundaries, I think it's especially important that you keep your clothes on. If that's your boundary, you know, that's like, maybe that's the repair Mm -hmm. when it comes to genital de-armoring. I have done de-armoring sessions where the person is covered by a blanket, you know? So I'm, my hands are making contact in the de-armoring process, but they're not exposed. Yeah. Right. So they're, they're covered. So that is possible, but I will say that the vast majority of genital de-armoring sessions are unclothed because the practitioner needs access to the tissues and fascia, either internally or externally at the vulva or the penis that is armored in order to de-armor it. Mm Mm-hmm. We did the throat de-armoring too. Yes. Yes. And I've kind of been offering that as an option, like kind of a a starting point to see how clients might feel about the de-armoring and what it might look like. And it's not as high risk as being nude or having their genitals uh, exposed or touched. So I've I've been playing around with that because people get really, again, stigma nakedness, yep. nudity, like, let's be real. Sure. sure, sure. <laughs> Scary. You know, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's great that, that you're offering the throat and jaw de-armoring beforehand. I think that's perfect. That's really wonderful. Cause then they can really get a sense, especially with the jaw, you know, the spaciousness they feel they mm-hmm. can correlate. Oh, okay. That's what, that's what's possible in my pelvis. Okay. I get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Third question is when is de-armoring not a method i'm assuming they're asking like when won't it work or when is it not something you would use sure that's a really great question sometimes i'll get inquiries where 
you know, here's a great example. It's like I've gotten inquiries from people who grew up in very rigid religious environments where they're 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 wanting sexual dearmoring, but it's actually really letting go of their religious conditioning, you know, because okay. the religious conditioning is underpinning everything in their life, including their sexuality. So like I could dearmor their genitalia, but if their sexual rigid conditioning is still in place, it's going to come back. So in those situations, I will say, you know, I really feel like the root of your issue is to heal from the sexual con from the religious conditioning that is affecting your sexuality, but is not, you know, the root cause is not sexual in nature. Interesting. Yeah. So like, it, do you mean if somebody's still in the religion or? They could be either in the religion or the effects of their religious conditioning. Like I'm thinking, the example I'm thinking thinking of is I've had people from the Mormon religion reach out to me over years. Yes, yeah, same. Yeah, and it's very intense. You know, yeah. it's very like kind of seeped throughout their lifestyle, their community, their family. And, you know, after hearing about what they feel like their religious, their sexuality obstacle is, like one woman wanted to have multiple orgasms but it was clear that what she learned in her religion was what was getting in the way. Physiologically, she was fine. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like the, it's what she believed and, and internalized. And so until she really unravels that, I, I didn't feel like doing a, a genital dearmoring uh, session or sessions with her was getting to the root of it. Mm. So how, how would you like, what would those people do? Well, I refer her to like uh, like a religious, um, like a, an expert in religious conditioning and deconditioning. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good to yeah. know. So there's a woman who wrote a book from the Mormon church and she, her whole book is about deconditioning from the influences of that religion. And so I referred this client to her. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll and grab so that link from you too, so I can share it. I I do have quite a few Mormon. Yeah. Clients. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ex-Mormon, but yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's, a, that's, that's an example of when genital dearmoring is really, you know, so I'm always listening for like, well, what's really the root issue here? Mm -hmm. You know, is mm -hmm. it something sexual or is it like something beyond that? And a mm -hmm. lot of times it would be like a religious, um, uh, conditioning that that is affecting everything in their life including their sexual obstacles yeah huh well thank you thank you rahi sure. this was i can't believe that wait let me check the time we're at 60 minutes that that was an hour of talking that just flew by flew by i know <laughs> it like we were hanging out and chatting and boom yeah and and still i learned from you every time i I show up oh, in space with you. So thank you. I really admire that. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm so delighted. It's great to talk to you. Oh, uh, how can how can people, listeners, how can they find you? Sure. So my website is somaticsexualwholeness.com. And pretty much everything is on that site. You can access my podcast, my online course called The Three Keys to Genital Dearmoring, which just launched yesterday. I mean, if people are interested, People can register until the 27th, but th that is being that's usually offered at least once a year. And yeah, everything can be found on somaticsexualwholeness.com. Great. Awesome. Thank you. And yeah, if you're listening, I highly recommend that course. <laughs> cool. Thank you to all of the amazing listeners for tuning in to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. If you're looking for more ways to connect, you can follow me at the.sexed.show or my individual Instagram at sexed for the modern bed. Until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body, and stay in presence. <laughs>